Chapter 10 of The Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus, translated by Arthur S. Way, born 13 February 1847, died 25 December 1930. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Now were the Trojans without the wall of Priam armor clad, with battle cars and chariot steeds, for still they burnt their dead. And still they feared lest the Achaean men should fall on them. They looked and saw them come with furious speed against the walls. In haste they cast a hurried earth mound o'er the slain, for greatly trembled they to see their foes. Then in their sore disquiet spake to them Polydamus, a wise and prudent chief. Friends, unendurably against us now maddens the war. Go to, let us devise how we may find deliverance from our strait. Still by the Danians here, still gather strength. Now, therefore, let us man our stately towers, and thence withstand them, fighting night and day, until yon Danians weary and return to Sparta, or, renownless lingering here beside the wall, lose heart. No strength of theirs shall breach the long walls, howsoe'er they strive. For in the imperishable work of gods weakness is none. Food, drink we shall not lack, for in Priam's gold-abounding halls is stored abundant food that shall suffice for many more than we through many years, though thrice so great a host that our desire should gather, eager to maintain our cause. Then chode with him Anchises' valiant son, Polydamus, wherefore do they call thee wise, who biddest suffer endless tribulations cooped within walls? Never, howe'er so long the Achaeans tarry here, will they lose heart. But when they see us sulking from the field, more fiercely will press on. So ours shall be the sufferance, perishing in our native home, if for long season they beleaguer us. No food, if we be pent within our walls, shall Thebes send us, nor may I only a wine. But wretchedly by famine shall we die, though the great wall stand firm. Nay, though our lot should be to scape that evil death and doom, and not by famine miserably to die, yet rather let us fight in armor clad for children and brave fathers. Haply Zeus will help us yet. Of his high blood are we. Nay, even though we be abhorred of him, better straightway to perish gloriously, fighting unto the last for fatherland, than to die a death of lingering agony. Shouted they all who heard that gallant reed, swiftly with helms and shields and spears they stood in close array. The eyes of mighty Zeus from heaven beheld the Trojans armed for fight against the Danians. Then did he awake courage in these and those, that there might be strain of unflinching fight twixt host and host. That day was Paris doomed for Helen's sake fighting by Philoctetes' hands to die. In one place strife incarnate drew them all. The fearful battle queen beheld of none, but cloaked in clouds blood raining. On she stalked, swelling the mighty roar of battle. Now rushed through Troy's squadrons, through Achaea's now. Panic and fear still waited on her steps to make their father's sister glorious. From small to huge that fury stature grew, her arms of adamant were blood besprent. The deadly lance she brandished reached the sky. Earth quaked beneath her feet. Tread blast of fire flamed from her mouth. Her voice pealed thunder-like, kindling strong men. Swift closed the front of fight, drawn by a dread power to the mighty work. Loud as the shriek of winds that madly blow in early spring, when the tall woodland trees put forth their leaves, loud as the roar of fire blazing through the sun-scorched breaks, Loud as the voice of many waters, when the wide sea raves beneath the howling blast, with thunderous crash of waves, when shake the fearful shipmen's knees, so thundered earth beneath their charging feet. Strife swooped on them, foe hurled himself on foe. First did Aeneas of the Danians slay Harpalion, Arizelus Scion, born in far Boethia of Aphomenoe, who came to Troy to help the Argive men with godlike Prothonia. Neath his waist Aeneas stabbed him, and reft sweet life from him. Dead upon him he cast for Sander's son, for the barbed javelin pierced through Hylas' throat, whom Aretheus by Lathaeus bare in Crete. 
sore grieved Idomeneus for his fall. By this Pleiades' son had swiftly slain twelve Trojan warriors with his father's spear. First Cebrus fell, Harmon, Pasithius then, Hysminius, Chedus, and Imbrasius, Phagus, Menesus, Enomus, and Phinous, Phasus, Calnus last, who had his home by Gargas steep, a mighty warrior he among Troy's mightiest. With a countless host to Troy he came, for Priam, Dardanus' son, promised him many gifts and passing fair. Ah, fool! His own doom he never foresaw, whose weird was suddenly to fall in fight, ere he bore home King Priam's glorious gifts. Doom the destroyer, against the Argives sped valiant Aeneas' friend Eurymenes. Wild courage spurred him on, that he might slay many, and then fill death's cup for himself. Man after man he slew, like some fierce beast, and foes shrank from the terrible raids that burned on his life's verge, nor wrecked of imminent doom. Yea, peerless deeds in that fight had he done, had not his hands grown weary, his spearhead bent utterly, his sword availed him not, snapped at the hilt by fate. Then Megas dart smote neath his ribs, blood spurted from his mouth, and in death's agony doom stood at his side. Even as he fell, Epeius' henchmen twain, Dileon and Amphion, rushed to strip his armor, but Aeneas, brave and strong, chilled their hot hearts in death beside the dead, as one in latter summer mid his vines kills wasps that dart about his ripening grapes, and so, ere they may taste the fruit they die, so smote he them, ere they could seize the arms. Menon and Amphius Tydeus slew, both goodly men, Paris slew Hippasus' son Damoleon, who in Lycia's land beside the outfall of Eurotas dwelt, the stream deep flowing. And to Troy came with Menelaus. Under his right breast the shaft of Paris smote him unto death, driving his soul forth like a scattering breath. Tursa slew Zechus, Medon's war-famed son, who dwelt in Phrygia, land of myriad flocks, below that haunted cave of fair-haired nymphs, where, as Endymion slept beside his kind, divine Selina watched him from on high, and slid from heaven to earth, for passionate love drew down the immortal stainless queen of night. And a memorial of her couch abides still neath the oaks, for mid the copses round was poured out milk of kine, and still do men marvelling behold its whiteness. Thou wouldst say far off that this was milk indeed, which is a wellspring of white water, if thou draw a little nigher, lo, the stream is fringed as though with ice, for white stone rims it round. Rushed on Alcasius Megas, Phileus' son, and drave his spear beneath his fluttering heart. Loosed were the cords of sweet life suddenly, and his sad parents longed in vain to greet that son returning from the woeful war to Margassus and Phyllis, lovely girt, dwellers by loosened streams of Harpasus who pours the full blood of his clamorous flow into Meander, madly rushing I. With Glaucus' warrior comrade Scalachius, Oleus' son closed in the fight, and stabbed over the shield-rim, and the cruel spear passed through his shoulder, and drenched his shield with blood. Howbeit he slew him not, whose day of doom awaited him far beside the wall of his own city. For when Ilium's towers were brought low by that swift avenging host, fleeing the war to Lycia, then he came alone. And when he drew nigh to the town, the thronging women met and questioned him touching their sons and husbands, and he told how all were dead. They compassed him about and stoned the man with great stones that he died. So he had no joy of his winning home, but the stones muffled up his dying groans. And of the same his ghastly tomb was reared beside Bellerophon's grave and holy place in Talos, nigh that far-famed Chimera's crag. Yet though he thus fulfilled his day of doom, as a god afterward men worshipped him by Phoebus' hest, and never his honour fades. Now Poeas son of the wild slew the Ionas, and the Machus, and Tenor's warrior son. Yea, a great host of strong men he laid low. On, like the war-god, through his foes he rushed, or as a river roaring in full flood breaks down long dikes, when maddening round its rocks down from the mountain swelled by rain it pours and ever flowing mighty rushing stream 
whose foaming crest over its foreland sweep so none who saw him even from afar dared meet renowned peoeus valiant son whose breast with battle fury was filled whose limbs were clad in mighty hercules arms of cunning workmanship for on the belt gleamed bears most grim and savage jackals fell and panthers in whose eyes seemed to lurk a deadly smile there were fierce-hearted wolves and boars with flashing tusks and mighty lions all seeming strangely alive and there portrayed all through its breath were battles murder rife with all these marvels covered was the belt and with yet more the quiver was adorned there hermes was storm-footed son of zeus slaying huge argus nigh to anacus streams argus whose sentinel eyes in turn took sleep and there was phaethon from the sun-car hurled into eridanus earth verily seemed ablaze and black smoke hovered on the air there perseus slew medusa gorgon-eyed by the stars baths and utmost bounds of earth and fountains of deep-flowing ocean where night in the far west meets the setting sun there was the titan lepatus great sun hung from the beetling crag of caucasus in bonds of adamant and the eagle tear his liver unconsumed he seemed to groan all these Hephaestus' cunning hands had wrought for hercules and these to Poeas son most near of friends and dear he gave to bear so glorying in those arms he smote the foe but paris at the last to meet him sprang fearlessly bearing in his hands the bow and deadly arrows but his latest day now met himself a flying shaft he sped forth from the string which sang as leapt the dart which flew not vainly yet the very mark it missed for philoctetus swerved aside a hair breadth and it smote above the breast cleodorus war renowned and cleft a path clear through his shoulder for he had not now the buckler broad which wore to fetch from death its bearer but was falling back from fight being shieldless for polydamus massy lance had cleft the shoulder belt whereby his targe hung and he gave back therefore fighting still with stubborn spear but now the arrow of death fell on him as from ambush leaping forth so fate willed i trow to bring dread doom on noble-hearted lernus skion born of amphiali in roads the fertile land but soon as peoeas battle-eager son marked him by paris deadly arrow slain swiftly he strained his bow shouting aloud dog i will give thee death will speed thee down to the unseen land who darest to brave me and so shall they have rest who travail now for thy vile sake destruction shall have end when thou art dead the author of our bane then to his breast he drew the plated cord the great bow arched the merciless shaft was aimed straight and the terrible point a little peered above the bow in that constraining grip loud sang the string as the death hissing shaft leapt and missed not yet was paris heart not stilled but his spirit yet was strong within him for that first arrow was not winged with death it did but graze the fair flesh by his wrist then once again the avenger drew the bow and the barbed shaft the peoeus son had plunged ere he could swerve twixt flank and groin no more he abode the fight but swiftly hasted back as haste a dog which on a lion rushed at first then fleeth terror-stricken back so he his very heart with agony thrilled fled from the war still clashed the grappling host man slaying man i bloodlier waxed the fray as rained the blows corpse on corpse was flung confusedly like thunder-drops or flakes of snow or hailstones by wintry blasts that zeus behest strewn over the long hills and forest boughs so by a pitiless doom slain friends and foes in heaps on heaps were strown sorely groaned paris with torturing wound fainted his spirit leeches sought to allay his frenzy of pain but now drew back to troy the trojans and the danians to their ships swiftly returned for dark night put an end to strife and stole from men's limbs weariness pouring upon their eyes pain-healing sleep but through the livelong night no sleep laid hold of paris for his help no leech availed 
though ne'er so willing by his salves. His weird was only by Oenoe's hands to escape death's doom, if so she willed. Now he obeyed the prophecy, and he went exceeding loath, but grim necessity forced him thence to face the wife forsaken. Evil boding fowl shrieked o'er his head, or darted past to left still as he went. Now, as he looked at them, his heart sank, but hope whispered, haply vain their bodings are. But on their wings were borne visions of doom that blended with his pain. Into Oenoe's presence thus he came. Amazed her thronging handmaids looked on him, as at the nymph's feet that pale suppliant fell, faint with the anguish of his wound, whose pangs stabbed him through brain and heart. Yea, quivered through his very bones, for that fierce venom crawled through all his innards with corrupting fangs, and his life fainted in him, agony thrilled. As one with sickness and tormenting thirst consumed lies parched, with heart quick shuddering, with liver seething in flame, the soul scarce conscious, fluttering at his burning lips, longing for life, for water longing sore, so was his breast one fire of torturing pain. Then, in exceeding feebleness, he spake. O oh, reverence wife, turn not from me in hate, for that I left thee widowed long ago. Not of my will I did it. The strong fates dragged me to Helen. O oh, that I had died ere I embraced her, and thy arms had died. Ah, by the gods, I pray, the lords of heaven, by all the memories of our wedded love, be merciful. Banish my bitter pain. Lay on my deadly wound those healing salves, which only can, by fate's decree, remove this torment if thou wilt. Thine heart must speak my sentence, to be saved from death or no. Pity me! Oh, make haste to pity me! This venom's might is swiftly bringing death. Heal me! while life yet lingers in my limbs. Remember not those pangs of jealousy, nor leave me to a cruel doom to die, low fallen at thy feet. This should offend the prayers, the daughters of the thunderer Zeus, whose anger followeth unrelenting pride with vengeance, and the Orenus executes their wrath. My queen, I sinned, in folly sinned, yet from death save me. Oh, make haste to save! So prayed he, but her darkly boding heart was stilled, and her words mocked his agony. Thou comest unto me, thou who didst leave erewhile a wailing wife in a desolate home, didst leave her for thy tendered darling. Go, lie laughing in her arms for bliss. She is better than thy true wife, is, rumour saith, Immortal, make haste to kneel to her, but not to me. Weep not to me, nor whimper pitiful prayers. Oh, that mine heart beat with a tigress strength, that I might tear thy flesh and lap thy blood for all the pain thy folly brought on me. Vile wretch, where now is love's queen glory crowned? Hath Zeus forgotten his daughter's paramour? Have them for thy deliverers. Get thee hence, far from my dwelling, curse of gods and men. Yea, for through thee, thou miscreant, sorrow came on deathless gods, for sons and sons' sons slain. Hence from my threshold, to thy Helen go. Agonize day and night beside her bed. There, whimper, pierced to the heart with cruel pangs, until she heal thee of thy grievous pain. So from her door she drave that groaning man. Ah, fool, not knowing her own doom, whose weird was straightway after him to tread the path of death. So fate had spun her destiny thread. Then, as he stumbled down through Ida's breaks, where doom on his death path was leading him, painfully halting, Wrapped with heart-sick pain, Hera beheld him with rejoicing soul, Throned in the Olympian palace court of Zeus. And seated at her side were handmaidens four, Whom radiant face Selene bare to the sun To be unwearying ministers in heaven, 
in form and office diverse each from each for of the seasons one was summer's queen and one of winter and his stormy star of spring the third of autumn tide the fourth so in four portions parted is man's year ruled by these queens in turn but of all this be zeus himself the overseer in heaven and of those issues now these spake with her which baleful fate in her all-ruining heart was shaping to the birth the new espousals of helen fatal to deiphobus the wrath of helenus who hoped in vain for that fair bride and how when he had fled wroth with the trojans to the mountain height achaea's sons would seize him and would hail unto their ships how by his counselling strong Tydeus' son should with Odysseus scale the great wall, and should slay Alcalthus the temple warder, and should bear away Pallas the gracious with her free consent, whose image was the sure defence of Troy. Yea, for not even a god, how wroth so e'er, had power to lay the city of Priam waste, while that immortal shape stood water there. No man had carven that celestial form, but Cronos' son himself had cast it down from heaven to Priam's gold-abounding burg. Of these things with her handmaidens did the queen of heaven hold converse, and of many such. But Paris, while they talked, gave up the ghost on Ida. Never Helen saw him more. Loud wailed the nymphs around him, for they still remembered how their nursling wont to lisp his childish prattle, compassed with their smiles and with them mourned the neat herds light of foot sorrowful hearted moaned the mountain glens then unto travail burden priam's queen a herdsman told the dread doom of her son wildly her trembling heart leapt when she heard with failing limbs she sank to earth and wailed dead thou dead o oh, dear child grief heaped on grief thou hast bequeathed me grief eternal Best of all my sons, save Hector alone, wast thou. While beats my heart, my grief shall weep for thee. The hand of heaven is in our sufferings. Some fate devised our ruin. Oh, that I had lived not to endure it, but had died in wealthy days of peace. But now I see woes upon woes, and ever look to see worse things. My children slain, my city sacked and burned with fire by stony-hearted foes daughters sons wives all trojan women held into captivity with our little ones so well she but the king heard not thereof but weeping ever sat by hector's grave for most of all his sons he honoured him his mightiest the defender of his land nothing of paris knew that pierced heart but long and loud lamented helen yet those wails were but for trojan ears her soul with other thoughts was busy as she cried husband to me to troy and to thyself a bitter blow is this thy woeful death in misery hast thou left me and i look to see calamities more deadly yet oh that the spirits of storm had snatched me from the earth when first i fared with thee drawn by baleful fate it might not be the gods have met in ruin to thee and me with shuddering horror all men look on me all hate me place of refuge is there none for me for if to the daddian host i fly with torments will they greet me if i stay troy's daughters and sons will here compass me and rend me earth shall not cover my corpse but dogs and fowl of raven shall devour oh had fate slain me ere i saw these woes so cried she but for him far less she mourned than for herself remembering her own sin yea and troy's daughters but in semblance well for him of other woes their hearts were full some thought on parents some on husbands slain these on sons on honoured kinsmen those only one heart was pierced with grief unfeigned o enoe not with them of troy she wailed but far away within that desolate home moaning she lay on her lost husband's bed 
as when the copses on high mountains stand white veiled with frozen snow which o'er the glens the west wind blast have strown but now the sun in east wind melted fast and the long heights with watercourses stream and down the glades slide as they thaw the heavy sheets to swell the rushing waters of an ice-cold spring so melted she in tears of anguished pain and for her own husband agonized and cried to her heart with miserable moans woe for my wickedness oh hateful life i loved mine hapless husband dreamed with him to pace to eld's bright threshold hand in hand heart in heart the gods ordained not so oh had the black fates snatched me from the earth ere i from paris turned away in hate my living love hath left me yet will i dare to die with him for i loathe the light so cried she weeping weeping piteously remembering him whom death had swallowed up wasting as melteth wax before the flame yet secretly being fearful lest her sire should mark it or her handmaidens till the night rose from broad ocean flooding all the earth with darkness bringing men release from toil then while her father and maidens slept slid she the bolts back of the outer doors and rushed forth like a storm blast fast she ran as when a heifer mid the mountains speeds her heart with passion stung to meet her mate and madly races with flying feet and fears not in her frenzy of desire the herdsman as her wild rush bears her on so she but find her mate amid the woods so down the long tracks flew our enemy's feet seeking the awful pyre to leap thereon though weariness she knew as upon wings her feet flew faster ever onward spurred by fell fate and the cyperian queen she feared no shaggy beast that met her in the dark who erst had feared them sorely rugged rock and precipice of tangled mountain slope she trod them all on stumbling torrent bed she leapt the white moon goddess from on high looked on her and remembered her own love princely endymion and she pitied her in that wild race and shining overhead in her full brightness made the long tracks plain through mountain gorges so she won to wear wailed other nymphs round alexander's corpse roared up about him a great wall of fire for from the mountains far and near had come shepherds and heaped the death bell broad and high for loves and sorrows latest service done to one of old their comrade and their king sore weeping stood they round she raised no well broken-hearted when she saw him there but in her mantle muffling up her face leapt on the pyre loud well that multitude there burned she clasping paris all the nymphs marvelled beholding her beside her lord flung down and heart to heart spake whispering verily evil-hearted paris was who left a leal true wife and took for bride a wanton to himself and troy a curse ah fool who recked not of the broken heart of a most virtuous wife who more than life loved him who turned from her and loved her not so in their hearts the nymphs spake but they twain burned on the pyre never to hail again the day spring wandering shepherds stood around as once the thronging argives marvelling saw evadne clasping mid the fire her lord capaneus slain by zeus dread thunderbolt but when the blast of devouring fire had made twain one o enemy in paris now one little heap of ashes then with wine quenched they the embers and they laid their bones in a wide golden vase and round them piled the earth mound and they set two pillars there that each from other ever turn away for the old jealousy in the marble lives end of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of the Fall of Troy by Smyrnanius Quintus. 
Translated by Arthur S. Way. Born 13 February 1847. Died 25 December 1930. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Troy's daughters mourned within her walls. Might none go forth to Paris' tomb, For far away from high-built Troy it lay. But the young men without the city Toiled unceasingly in fight, Wherein from slaughter rest was none, Though dead was Paris. For the Achaeans pressed hard on the Trojans, Even unto Troy. Yet these charged forth, They could not choose but so, For strife and deadly Eno in their midst stalked, Like the fellow Aeneas to behold, Breathing destruction from their lips like flame. Beside them raged the ruthless-hearted fates, Fiercely. Here panic fear, and Ares there Stirred up the host. Hard after followed dread with slaughter's gore besprent, That in one host men might see and be strong, In the other fear. And all around were javelins, spears, and darts, Murder a thirst from this side, that side showered. Aye, as they hurled together, armor clashed, As foe with foe grappled in murderous fight. There Neoptolemus slew Laomedas, Whom Lycia nurtured by fair Xanthos stream. The stream revealed to men by Leto, Pride of Thunderer Zeus, When Lycia's stormy plain was by her hand Uptorn mid agonies of travail throes, wherein she brought to light mid bitter pangs those babes of birth divine. Tyrus upon him laid he dead, the spear crashed through his jaw, and clear through mouth and tongue passed. On the lance's irresistible point shrieking he was paled, flooded with gore his mouth was, as he cried. The cruel shaft sped on by that strong hand, dashed him to the earth in throes of death. Even or next he smote above the flank, and onward drave the spear into his liver. Swiftly anguished death came upon him. If Ithion next he slew, He quelled Hippodamion, Hippasus' bold son, Whom Ocyone the nymph had borne Beside Sangarius' river flow. Ne'er welcomed she her son's returning face, But ruthless fate with anguish thrilled her, Of her child relieved. Paramon Aeneas slew, And Adromachus of Knossus this, Of hallowed Lycus that, on one spot both from their swift chariots fell. This gasped for death, his throat by the long spear transfixed, that other by a massy stone sped from a strong hand on the temple struck, breathed out his life, and black dooms shrouded him. The startled steeds bereft of charioteers, fleeing mid all those corpses, were confused, and princely Aeneas' henchmen seized on them with hearts exulting in the goodly spoil. There Philoctetes with his deadly shaft smote Pyrrhasus in act to flee the war. The tendons trained behind the knee it snapped, and palsied all his speed. A Danian marked, and leapt on that maimed man with sweep of sword, shearing his neck through. On the breast of earth the headless body fell, the head far flung, when rolling with lips parted as to shriek, and swiftly fleeted thence the homeless soul. Palladamus struck down Eurymachus, and Cleon with his spear. From Seme came, with Nereus following these. Cunning were both in craft of fisher-folk, To cast the hook baited with guile, To drop into the sea the net. From the boat's prow with deftest hands, Swiftly and straight to plunge the three-forked spear. But not from pain their sea-craft saved them now. Eurypylus, battle-staunch, laid Hellas low, Whom Cleato bare beside Gagea's mare. Cleato the fair cheeked. Face down in the dust outstretched he lay, shorn by the cruel sword from his strong shoulder, fell the arm that held his long spear. Still its muscles twitched, as though fain to uplift the lance for fight. In vain! For the man's will no longer stirred therein, but aimlessly it quivered, even as leaps the severed tail of a snake malignant hide which cannot chase the man who dealt the wound, so the right hand of that strong-hearted man with impotent grip still clutched the spear for fight. Anus and Polydorus Odysseus slew. Satayans both, this perished by his spear, 
that by his sword death dealing stantilus smote godlike albus with a javelin cast on through his throat and shuddering nape it rushed stopped were his heart beats all his limbs collapsed tydeus slew Lyadocus. Meleus fell by Agamemnon's hand, Deipibus smote Halcimus and Dryas, Hippasus, how war-renowned so e'er Agenor slew, far from Peneus river. Crushed by fate, love's nursing debt to parents ne'er he paid. Lamus and stalwart Lyncus Thoas smote, and Meronius slew Lycon. Menelaus laid low Archelochus. Upon his home looked down Corycia's ridge, and that great rock of the wise fire-god. Marvellous in men's eyes. For thereon, night long, day long, unto him fire blazes, tireless and unquenchable. Laden with fruit around its palm trees grow, while mid the stones fire plays about their roots. God's work is this, a wonder to all time. By Tercer, princely Hippomedion, son was slain. Menoites, as the archer drew on him, rushed he to smite him, but already hand and eye and bowcraft keen were aiming straight on the arching horn of the shaft. Swiftly released, they leapt on the hapless man, while sang the string. Stricken full front, he heaved one choking gasp, because the fates on the arrow riding flew right to his heart, the throne of thought and strength for men, whence the short path is unto death. Far from his brawny hand Euryalus hurled a massy stone, and shook the ranks of Troy. As when in anger against long screaming cranes a watcher in the fields leaps from the ground, with swift hand whirling round his head the sling, and speeds the stone against them, scattering before its hum their ranks far down the wind outspread, and they in huddled panic dart with wild cries, this way and that, who theretofore swept on in ordered lines. So shrank the foe to left and right, from that dread bolt of doom hurled by Euryalus. Not in vain it flew, fate-winged, it shattered Mila's helm and head down to the eyes, so met him ghastly death. Still man slew man, and earth groaned all around, as when a mighty wind scourges the land, and this way and that, under its shrieking blast through the wide woodland bow the roots and fall great trees, while all the earth is thundering round, so fell they in the dust, so clanged their arms, so crashed the earth around. Still hot were they for fell fight, still dealt pain unto their foes. Nigh unto Aeneas Apollo came, and to Eurymachus, brave Antenor's son. For these against the mighty Achaeans fought shoulder to shoulder, as two strong oxen, matched in age, yoked to a wain, nor ever ceased from battling. Suddenly spake the god to these in Polymestor's shape. The seer his mother by Xanthus bare to the far daughter's priest. Eurymachus, Aeneas, seed of gods, t'were shame if ye should flinch from the Argives. Nay, not ere his self should joy to counter you, and ye were to face him in the fray. For fate hath spun long destiny threads for thee and thee. He spake and vanished, mingling with the winds. But their hearts felt the god's power. Suddenly flooded with boundless courage were their frames. Maddened their spirits. On the foe they leapt like furious wasp that in the storm of rage swoop on bees, beholding them draw nigh in latter summer to the mellowing grapes, or from their highs forth streaming thitherward. So fiercely leapt these sons of Troy to meet war-hardened Greeks. The black fates joyed to see their conflict. Ares laughed. Eno yelled horribly. Loud their glancing armor clanged. They stabbed. They hewed down hosts of foes untold with irresistible hands. The reeling ranks fell as the swath falls in the harvest heat when the swift-handed reapers ranged adown the fields long furrows ply the sickle fast. So fell before their hands ranks numberless. With corpses earth was heaped, with torrent blood was streaming, strife incarnate o'er the slain gloated. They paused not from the awful toil, but I pressed on, like lions chasing sheep. Then turned the Greeks to craven flight, 
all feet unmaimed as yet fled from the murderous war i followed on anchises' warrior son smiting foes backs with his avenging spear on pressed eurymachus while glowed the heart of healer apollo watching from on high as when a man descries a herd of swine draw nigh his ripening corn before the sheaves fall neath the reaper's hands and hearkeneth on against them his strong dogs as down they rush the spoilers see and quake no more they think of feasting but they turn in panic flight huddling fast followed at their heels the hounds biting remorselessly while long and loud squealing they flee and joys the harvest lord so rejoiced phoebus seeing from the war fleeing the mighty argive host no more they cared for the deeds of men but cried to the gods for swift feet in whose feet alone was hope to escape eurymachus and aeneas spears which lightened ever along their rear but one greek over trusting his strength or by fate's malice to destruction drawn curb did mid-flight from war's turmoil his steed and strove to wheel him round into the fight to face the foe but fierce agenor thrust ere he was ware his two-edged partisan sure through the shoulder yea the very bone of that gashed arm was cloven by the steel the tendons parted the vain spirited blood down by his horse's neck he slid and straight fell mid the dead but still the strong arm hung with rigid fingers locked about the reins like a live man's weird marvel was that sight the bloody hand down hanging from the reins scared the foes yet more by ares will thou hadst said it craveth still for horsemanship so bare the steed that sign of his slain lord aeneas hurled his spear it found the waist of anthalus son it pierced the navel through dragging the innards with it stretched in the dust clutching with agonized hand at steel and bowels horribly shrieked he tore with his teeth the earth groaning till life and pain forsook the man scared were the argives like a startled team of oxen neath the yoke band straining hard what time the sharp fanged gadfly stings their flanks a thirst for blood and they in frenzy of pain start from the furrow and sore disquieted the hind is for marred work and for their sake lest haply the recoiling ploughshare light on their leg sinews and hamstring his team so were the danians scared so feared for them achilles son and shouted thunder voiced cravens why flee like starlings nothing worth scared by a hawk that swoopeth down on them come play the men better it is far to die in war than choose unmanly flight then to his cry they hearkened and straightway were of good heart mighty of mood he leapt upon the trojans swinging in his hand the lightning spear swept after him his host of myrmidons with hearts swelled with the strength resistless of a tempest so the greeks won a breathing space with fury like his sires one on other slew he of the foe recoiling back they fell as waves on rolled by boreas foaming from the deep to the strand are caught by another blast that whirlwind like leaps in a short lull of the north wind forth smites them full face and hurls them back from the shore so them that erewhile on the danians pressed godlike achilles son now backward hurled a short space only brave aeneas spirit let him not flee but made him bide the fight fearlessly and eno level held the battle scales yet not against aeneas achilles son upraised his father's spear but else whither turned his fury in reverence for aphrodite that his splendour veiled turned from that man her mighty son's son's rage and giant strength on other host of foes there he slew many a trojan while the ranks of greeks were ravaged by aeneas hand over the battle slain the vultures joyed hungry to rend the hearts and flesh of men but all the nymphs were wailing daughters born of xanthus and fair flowing samoas so toiled they in the fight the wind's breath rolled huge dust clouds up the illimitable air was one thick haze as with a sudden mist earth disappeared 
faces were blotted out, yet still they fought on. Each man whom so he met ruthlessly slew him, though his very friend it might be. In that turmoil none could tell who met him, friend or foe. Fine Wildermid enmeshed the host. And now had all been blent confusedly, had perished miserably, all falling by their fellows' murderous swords. Had not Cronian from Olympus helped their sore strait, he swept aside the dust of conflict, he calmed those deadly winds. Yet still the host fought on, but lighter far their battle travail was, who now discerned whom in the fray to smite and whom to spare. The Danians now forced back the Trojan host, the Trojans now the Danian ranks, as swayed the dread fight to and fro. From either side darts leapt and fell like snowflakes. Far away shepherds from Ida trembling watched the strife, and to the heaven abiders lifted hands of supplication, praying that all their foes might perish, and that from woeful war Troy might win breathing space, and see at last the day of freedom. The gods hearkened not. Far other issues fate devised, nor wrecked of Zeus the Almighty, nor of none beside of the immortals. Her unpitying soul cares not what doom she spinneth with her thread inevitable, be it for men newborn or cities. All things wax and wane through her. So by her hest the battle travail swelled twixt Trojan chariot lords and Greeks that closed in grapple of fight. They dealt each other death ruthlessly. No man quelled, but stout of heart fought on, for courage thrust men into war. But now, when many had perished in the dust, then did the Argive might prevail at last, by stern decree of Pallas, for she came into the heart of battle, hot to help the Greeks to lay waste Priam's glorious town. Then Aphrodite, who lamented sore for Paris slain, snatched suddenly away renowned Aeneas from the deadly strife, and poured thick mist about him. Fate forbade that hero any longer to contend with Argive foes without the high-built wall. Yea, and his mother sorely feared the wrath of Pallas, passing wise, whose heart was keen to help the Danians now. Yea, feared lest she might slay him, even beyond his doom, who spared not Ares' self, a mightier far than he. No more the Trojans now abode the edge of fight, but all disheartened backward drew. For like fierce ravening beasts the Argive men leapt on them, mad with murderous rage of war, Choked with their slain the river channels were. Heaped was the field, in red dust thousands fell. Horses and men, and chariots overturned, were strewn there. Blood was streaming all around like rain, for deadly doom raised through the fray. Men stabbed with swords, and men impaled on spears lay confusedly, like scattered beams, when on the strand of low thundering sea men from great girders of a tall ship's hull strike out with bolts and clamps, and scatter wide long planks and timbers, till the whole broad beach is paved with beams, or plashed with darkling surge. So lay in dust and blood those slaughtered men, rapture in pain of fight forgotten now. A remnant from the piteous strife escaped, entered their stronghold, scarce eluding doom. Children and wives from their limbs blood besprent received their arms bedabbed with foul gore and baths for all were heated. Leeches ran through all the town in hot haste to the homes of wounded men to minister to their hurts. Here wives and daughters moaned round men come back from war. There cried on many who came not here. Here men stung to the souls by bitter pangs groaned upon beds of pain. There toil-spread men turned them to suffer. Whinnied the swift steeds and neighed on mangers heaped. By tent and ships far off the Greeks did even as they of Troy. When o'er the streams of ocean dawn drove up with her splendor flashing steeds, and earth's tribes waked, then the strong Argives' battle-eager sons marched against Priam's city lofty towered. Save some that mid the tents by wounded men tarried, lest haply raiders on the ships might fall to help the Trojans, while these fought the foe from towers, while rose the flame of war. Before the Scaean gate fought Capaeasius' son, and godlike Diogenes. High above the Iphibus battle-staunch, 
and strong Polites with many comrades stealthily held them back with arrows and huge stones. Clanged evermore the smitten helms, and shield that fenced strong men from bitter doom and unrelenting fate. Before the gate I day and Achilles' son set in array the fight, around him toiled his host of battle-cunning Myrmidons. Helenus and Agenor, gallant-souled, down-hailing darts, against them held the wall, aye cheering on their men. No spurring these needed to fight hard for their country's walls. Odysseus and Eurypylus made assault unresting on the gates that faced the plain and looked to the swift ships. From wall and tower with huge stones brave Aeneas made defense. In battle stressed by Samoas, Tursa toiled. Each endured hardness at his several post. Then round war wise Odysseus men renowned, by that great captain's battle cunning ruled, locked shields together, raised them o'er their heads, ranged side by side, that many were made of one. Thou hadst said it was a great hall's solid roof, which no tempestuous wind blast misty wet can pierce, nor rain from heaven in torrents poured. So fenced about with shields firm stood the ranks of Argives, one in heart for fight, and one in that array close welded. From above the Trojans hailed great stones, as from a rock rolled these to earth. Full many a spear and dart, and galling javelin in the pierced shield stood. Some in earth stood, many glanced away, with bent points falling, baffled from the shields, battered on all sides. But that clangorous din none feared, none flinched, as pattering drops of rain they heard it. Upon the rampart's foot they marched, none hung back, shoulder to shoulder on they came, like a long lurid cloud that o'er the sky Cronian trails in wild midwinter tide. On that battalion moved, with thunderous tread of tramping feet. A little above the earth rose up the dust. The breeze swept it aside, drifting away behind the men. There went a sound confused of voices with them, like the hum of bees that murmur round the hives, and multitudinous panting, and the gasping of men hard breathing. Exceedingly glad the sons of Atreus, glorying in them, saw that wall unwavering of doom denouncing war. In one tense mass against the city gate they hurled themselves. With tribills strove to breach the long walls, from their hinges to upheave the gates, and dash to earth. The pulse of hope beat strong in those proud hearts, but naught availed targes nor levers, when Aeneas might swung in his hands a stone like a thunderbolt, hurled it with uttermost strength, and dashed to death all whom caught it beneath the shields, as when a mountain's precipice edge breaks off and falls on pasturing goats, and all that graze thereby tremble. So were those Danians dazed with dread. Stone after stone he hurled on the reeling ranks, as when amid the hills Olympian Zeus with thunderbolts and blazing lightning rends from their foundations crags that rim up peak. This way and that he sends them hurtling down, then flocks tremble, scattering in wild flight, so quell the Achaeans when Aeneas dashed to sudden fragments all that battle wall, molded of adamant shields, because a god gave more than human strength. No man of them could lift his eyes unto him in that fight, because the arms that lapped his sinewy limbs flashed like heaven-born lightnings. At his side stood all his form divine in darkness cloaked, Ares the Terrible and wing the flight of what bare down to the Argives' tomb or tread. He fought as when Olympian Zeus himself from heaven in wrath smote down the insolent bands of giants grim, and shook the boundless earth and sea, and ocean and heavens, when reeled the knees of Atlas neath the rush of Zeus. So crumbled down neath Aeneas' bolts the Argive squadrons. All along the wall, wroth with foemen, rushed he. From his hands, what so he lighted on in onset haste hurled he? For many a battle-slaying bolt lay on the walls of those staunch Dardan men. With such Aeneas stormed in giant might, with such drave back the thronging foes. All round the Trojans played the men. Sore travail in pain had folk round the city. Many fell, Argives and Trojans, rang the battle cries. Aeneas cheered the war-fain Trojans on, to fight for home, for wives, 
and their own souls with good heart. War staunch Achilles' son shouted, Flinch not ye Argives from the walls, till Troy be taken, and sink down in flames. And round these twain an awful measureless roar rang, day long as they fought, no breathing space came from the war to them whose spirits burned, these to smite Ilium, those to guard her safe. But from Aeneas valiant soul the far fought Aeas, speeding midst the men of Troy, winged death. For now his arrows straight through air flew, now his deadly dart, and smote them down, one after one. Yet others cowered away before his peerless prowess, and abode the fight no more, but fenceless left the wall. Then one of all the Locrians the mightiest, fierce-souled Alcimedon, trusting in his prince and his own might and valor of his youth, all battle-eager on a ladder set swift feet, to pay for friends a death-strewn path into the town. Above his head he raised the screening shield. Up that dread path he went, hardening his heart from trembling, in his hand now shook the threatening spear, now upward climbed. Fast high in air he trod the perilous way, now on the Trojans had disaster come. But even as above the parapet his head rose, and for the first time, and the last from her high rampart, he looked down on Troy, and he asked who had marked, albeit from afar, that bold assault rushed on him, dashed on his head so huge a stone that that hero's mighty strength shattered the ladder. Down from on high he rushed as arrow from the string. Death followed him as whirling round he fell. With air was blent his lost life ere he crashed through the stony ground. Strong spear, broad shield, in mid-fall flew from his hands, and from his head the helm. His corslet came alone with him to earth. The Locrian men groaned seeing their champion quelled by evil doom, for all his hair and all the stones around were blood bespattered, all his bones were crushed, and his once active limbs besprent with gore. Then godlike Peoeus war triumphed son marked where Aeneas stormed along the wall in lion-like strength, and straightway shot a shaft aimed at that glorious hero, neither missed the man, yet not through his unyielding targe to that fair-fleshed one, being turned aside by Cytheria and the shield, but grazed the buckler lightly, yet not all in vain fell earthward, but between the targe and helm smote Medon. From the tower he fell, as falls a wild goat from a crag, the hunter's shaft deep in his heart. So nerveless flung he fell, and fled away from him the precious life. Wrought for his friend, a stone Aeneas hurled, and Philoctetes' stalwart comrade slew, to Actimus, for he shattered his head, and crushed helmet and skull-bones, and his noble heart was stilled. Loud shouted princely Peoeus' son, Aeneas, thou forsooth dost deem thyself a mighty champion, fighting from a tower, whence craven women war with foes. If now thou be a man, Come forth without the wall in battle harness, and so learn to know in spearcraft and in bowcraft Peoeas' son. So cried he, but Anchises' valiant seed, how fain so e'er not answered, for the stress and desperate conflict round that wall in Burg ceaselessly raging. Pause from fight was none. Yea, for a long time no respite had there been for the war weary from that endless toil. End of chapter 11when round the walls of Troy the Danian host had borne much travail, and yet the end was not, by Calchas then assembled were the chiefs, for his heart was instructed by the hest of Phoebus, by the flight of birds, the stars, and all the signs that speak to men the will of heaven. So he to that assembly cried, No longer toil in leaguer of yon walls. Some other counsel let your hearts devise, some stratagem to help the host and us. For here but yesterday I saw a sign, a falcon chased a dove, 
and she hard pressed entered a cleft of the rock and chafing he tarried long time hard by that rift but she abode in convert nursing still his wrath he hid him in a bush forth darted she in folly deeming him afar he swooped and to the hapless dove dealt wretched death therefore by force assay we not to smite troy but let cunning stratagem avail he spake but no man's wit might find a way to escape their grievous travail as they sought to find a remedy till laertes son discerned it of his wisdom and he spake friend in high honour held of the heavenly ones if doomed it be indeed that priam's burg by guile must fall before the war-torn greeks a great horse let us fashion in the which our mightiest shall take ambush let the host burn all their tents and sail from hence away to tenedos so the trojans from their towers gazing shall stream forth fearless to the plain let some brave man unknown to any in troy with a stout heart abide without the horse crouching beneath its shadow who shall say achaia's lords of might exceeding fain safe to win home made this their offering for safe return an image to appease the wrath of pallas for her image stolen from troy and to this story he shall stand how long soe'er they question him until though never so relentless they believe and drag it their own doom within the town then shall war's signal unto us be given to them at sea by the sudden flash of torch to the ambush by the cry come forth the horse when unsuspecting sleep the sons of troy he spake and all men praised him most of all extolled him calchas that such marvellous guile he put into achaean hearts to be for them assurance of triumph but for troy ruin and to those battle lords he cried let your heart seek none other stratagem friends to war strong odysseus reed give ear his wise thought shall not miss accomplishment yea our desire even now the gods fulfil hark for new tokens come from the unseen lo there on high crash through the firmament zeus thunder and lightning see where birds to right dart past and scream with long resounding cry go to no more an endless leaguer of troy linger we hard necessity fills the foe with desperate courage that makes cowards brave for then are men most dangerous when they stake their lives in utter recklessness of death as battle now the aweless sons of troy all round their burg mad with lust of fight but cried achilles battle-eager son calchas brave men meet face to face their foes who sulk behind their walls and fight from towers are nitterings hearts palsied with base fear hence with all thought of wile and stratagem the great war travail of spears beseems true heroes best in battle are the brave but answer made him laetes seed bold-hearted child of aweless aeacus son this as beseems a hero princely and brave dauntlessly trusting in thy strength thou sayest yet thine invincible sire's unquelling might availed not to smite priam's wealthy burg nor we for all our travail nay with speed as counselleth calchas go we to the ships and fashion we the horse by apeius hands who in the woodwright's craft is chiefest far of argives for athena taught his lore then all their mightiest men gave ear to him save twain fierce-hearted neoptolemus and philoctetus mighty souled for these were still insatiate for the bitter fray still longed for turmoil of the fight they bade their own folk bear up against that giant wall what thing soe'er for walls assaults avail in hope to lay that stately fortress low seeing heaven's decree had brought them both to war yea they had haply accomplished all their will but from the sky zeus showed his wrath he shook the earth beneath their feet and all the air shuddered as down before those heroes twain he hurled his thunderbolt wide echoes crashed through all dardania unto fear straightway turned their bold hearts and forgot their might and calchas counsels 
grudgingly obeyed. So with the Argives came they to the ships, in reverence for the seer who spake from Zeus sought Phoebus, and they obeyed him utterly. What time round splendor kindled heavens the stars from east to west far-flashing wheel, and when man doth forget his toil, in that still hour Athena left the high mansion of the blessed, clothed in her shape as a maiden tender-fleshed, and came to ships and host. Over the head of brave Apeius stood she in his dream, and bade him build a horse of tree. Herself would labor in his labor, and herself stand by his side to the work enkindling him. Hearing the goddess' word, with a glad laugh he leapt from careless sleep. Right well he knew the immortal one, celestial. Now his heart could hold no thought beside, his mind was fixed upon the wondrous work, and through his soul marched marshalled each device of craftsmanship. When rose the dawn, and thrust back kindly night to Erebus, and through the firmament streamed glad glory, then Apeius told his dream to eager Argives, all he saw and heard, and hearkening joyed they with exceeding joy. Straightway to tall tressed Ida's leafy glades the sons of Atreus sent swift messengers. These laid the axe unto the forest pines, and hewed the great trees, to their smiting rang the echoing glens. On those far-stretching hills, all bare of undergrowth, the high peaks rose. Open their glades were, not as in time past, haunted of beast. There dry tree trunks rose, wooing the winds. Even these the Achaeans hewed with axes, and in haste they bare them down from those shagged mountain heights to Hellespont shores. Strained with a strenuous spirit at the work young men and mules, and all the people toiled each at his task, obeying a pious hest. For with the keen steel some were hewing beams, some measuring planks, and some with axes lopped branches away from tusk as yet unsawn. Each wrought his several work. Apeius first fashioned the feet of that great horse of wood. The belly next he shaped, and over this molded the back and the great loins behind, the throat in front, and ridged the towering neck with waving mane. The crested head he wrought, the streaming tail, the ears, the lucent eyes, all that of lifelike horses have, so grew like a live thing that more than human work, for a god gave to a man that wondrous craft. And in three days, by palace decree, finished was all. Rejoice thereat the host of Argos, marvelling how the wood expressed metal and speed of foot, yea, seemed to neigh. God like Apeius then uplifted hands to Pallas, and for that huge horse he prayed, here, great-souled goddess, bless thine horse and me. He spake. Athena rich in counsel heard, and made his work a marvel to all men which saw or heard its fame in days to be. But while the Danians or Apeius work joyed, and their routed foes within the walls tarried, and shrank from death and pitiless doom, then, when imperious Zeus far from the gods had gone to ocean's stream and Tethys' caves, strife rose between the immortals, heart with heart was set at variance. Riding on the blast of winds, from heaven to earth they swooped. The air crashed round them. Lightning down by Xanthus' stream arrayed they stood against each other. These were the Achaeans, for the Trojans those, and all their souls were thrilled with lust of war. There gathered too the lords of the wide sea. These in their wrath were eager to destroy the horse of guile and all the ships, and those fair Ilium. But all contriving fate held them therefrom, and turned their hearts to strife against each other. Ares to the fray rose first, and on Athena rushed. Thereat fell each on other. Clashed round their limbs the golden arm celestial as they charged. Round them the wide sea thundered, 
the dark earth quaked neath immortal feet rang from them all far pealing battle shouts that awful cry rolled up to the broad heaven and down even to hades fathomless abyss trembled the titans there in the depths of gloom ida's long ridges sighed sobbed clamorous streams of ever-flowing rivers groaned ravines far furrowed argive ships and priam's towers men feared not for naught they knew of all that strife by heaven's decree then her high peaks the gods hands wrenched from ida's crest and hurled against each other but like crumbling sand shivered they fell round those invincible limbs shattered to small dust but the mind of zeus at the utmost verge of earth was ware of all straight left he ocean's stream and to wide heaven ascended charioted upon the winds the east the north the west wind and the south for iris rainbow plume led neath the yoke of his eternal car that stormy team the car which timed the immortal frame for him of adamant with never wearying hands so came he to olympus giant ridge his wrath shook all the firmament as crashed from east to west his thunders lightnings gleamed thick and fast his thunderbolts poured to earth and flamed the limitless welkin terror fell upon the hearts of those immortals quake the limbs of all ay deathless though they were then themis trembling for them swift as thought leapt down through clouds and came with speed to them for in the strife she only had no part and stood between the fighters and she cried forbear the conflict oh when zeus is wroth it ill beseems that everlasting gods should fight for men's sake creatures of a day else shall ye be all suddenly destroyed for zeus will tear up all the hills and hurl upon you sons nor daughters will he spare but bury neath one ruin of shattered earth all no escape shall ye find thence to light in horror of darkness prisoned evermore dreading zeus menace they gave heed to her from strife refrained and cast away their wrath and were made one in peace and amity some heavenward soared some plunged into the sea on earth stayed some amid the achaean host spake in his subtlety laertes son o oh, valorous hearted lords of the argive host now prove in time of need what men ye be how passing strong how flawless brave the hour is this for desperate enterprise now with hearts heroic enter ye in yon carven horse so to attain the goal of this stern war for better it is by stratagem and craft to destroy this city for whose sake hither we came and still are suffering many afflictions far from our own land come then and let your hearts be stout and strong for he who in stress of fight hath turned to bay and snatched a desperate courage from despair oft though the weaker slays a mightier foe for courage which is all men's glory makes the heart great come then set the ambush ye which be our mightiest and the rest shall go to tenedos hallowed burg and there abide until our foes have held within their walls us with the horse as deeming that they bring a gift unto tritonus some brave man one whom the trojans know not yet we lack to harden his heart as steel and to abide near the horse let that man bear in mind heedfully whatsoe'er i said erewhile and let none other thought be in his heart lest to our foe our counsel be revealed then when all others feared a man far-famed made answer sinon marked of destiny to bring the great work to accomplishment therefore with worship all men looked on him the loyal of heart as in their midst he spake odysseus and all ye achaean chiefs this work for which ye crave will i perform yea though they torture me though into fire living they thrust me for mine heart is fixed not to escape but die by hands of foes except i crown with glory or desire 
Stoutly he spake. Right glad the Argives were, and one said, How the gods have given to-day high courage to this man! He hath not been heretofore valiant. Heaven is kindling him to be the Trojans' ruin, but to us salvation! Now full soon, I trow, we reach the goal of grievous war, so long unseen. So a voice murmured mid the Achaean host. Then, to stir up the heroes, Nestor cried, now is the time, dear sons, for courage and strength. Now do the gods bring nigh the end of toil. Now give they victory to our longing hands. Come, bravely enter ye this cavernous horse, for high renown attendeth courage high. Oh, that my limbs were mighty as of old, when Aeson's sons for heroes call to man-swift Argo. When of the heroes foremost I would gladly have entered her, But Peleus the king withheld me in mine own despite. Ah, me, but now the burden of years. Oh, nay, as I were young, into the horse will I fearlessly. Glory and strength shall courage give. Answered him golden-haired Achilles' son, Nestor, in wisdom thou art chief of men, but cruel age hath caught thee in his grip. No more thy strength may match thy gallant will. Therefore thou needs must unto Tenedos strand. We will take ambush, we the youths, of strife insatiate still, as thou, old sire, dost bid. Then strode the son of Neleus to his side, and kissed his hands, and kiss the head of him who offered thus himself the first of all to enter that huge horse, being peril fain, and bade the elder of days abide without. Then to the battle-eager spake the old, Thy father's son art thou, Achilles' might and chivalrous speech be here. O oh, sure am I that by thine hands the Argive shall destroy the stately city of Priam. At the last, after long travail, Glory shall be ours, after toil and tribulation of war. The gods have laid tribulation at men's feet, but happiness far off, and toil between. Therefore for men full easy is the path to ruin, and the path to fame is hard, where feet must crest right on through painful toil. He spake, replied Achilles' glorious son, Old sire, as thine heart trusteth, be it vouchsafed in answer to our prayers, for best were this. But if the gods will otherwise, be it so. I, gladlier will I fall in glory of fight than flee from Troy, bowed neath load of shame. Then in his sire's celestial arms he arrayed his shoulders, and with speed in harness sheath stood the most mighty heroes, in whose hearts was dauntless spirit. Tell, ye queens of song, now man by man the names of all that passed into the cavernous horse. For ye inspired my soul with all my song, ere long my cheek grew dark with manhood's beard, what time I fed my goodly sheep on Smyrna's pasture lee. From Hermes thrice so far as one may hear a man shout, by the fane of Artemis, in the deliverer's grove upon a hill neither exceeding low nor passing high. Into that cavernous horse Achilles' son first entered. Strong Menelaus followed then, Odysseus, Stempelus, godlike Diomede, Philoctetus, and Menestheus, Anticleus, Thoas, and Polypoetas, golden-haired, Aeas, Eurypolis, godlike Thrasymede, Idomeneus, Meriones, far-famous twain, Taldalarius of spears, Eurymachus, Tursa the godlike, fierce Iomenus, Thalpius, Antimachus, Leontius staunch, Eurymelus, and Euryalus, fair as a god, Amphimachus, Demophoon, Agapenor, Acamas, Megas, stalwart Phylus' son, yea, more, even all their chiefest entered in, so many as that carven horse could hold. God like Apeius last of all passed in, the fashioner of the horse, 
in his breast lay the secret of the opening of its doors and of their closing therefore last of all he entered and he drew the ladders up whereby they clomb then he made all secure and set himself beside the bolt so all in silence sat twixt victory and death but the rest fired the tents wherein erewhile they slept and sailed the wide sea in their ships two mighty-hearted captains ordered these nestor and agamemnon lord of spears fain had they also entered that great horse but all the host withheld them bidding stay with them a shipboard ordering their array for men far better work the works of war when their kings oversee them therefore these abode without albeit mighty men so came they swiftly unto tenedos shore and dropped the anchor stones then leapt in haste forth of the ships and silent waited there keen watching till the signal torch should flash but nigh the foe were they in the horse and now looked they for death and now to smite the town and on their hopes and fears uprose the dawn then marked the trojans upon hellespont's strand the smoke upleaping yet through air no more they saw the ships which brought to them from greece destruction dire with joy to the shore they ran but armed them first for fear still haunted them then marked they that fair carven horse and stood marvelling round for a mighty work was there a hapless seeming man thereby they spied Sinon, and this one that one questioned him touching the danians as in a great ring they compassed him and with unangry words first questioned then with terrible threatenings then tortured they that man of guileful soul long time unceasing firm as a rock abode the unquivering limbs the unconquerable will his ears his nose at last they shore away in every wise tormenting him until he should declare the truth whither were gone the danians in their ships what thing the horse concealed within he had armed his mind with resolution and of outrage foul recked not his soul endured their cruel stripes yea and the bitter torment of the fire for strong endurance into him hera breathed and still he told them the same guileful tale the argives in their ships flee over sea weary of tribulation of endless war this horse by calchas counsel fashioned they for wise athena to propitiate her stern wrath for that guardian image stolen from troy and by odysseus prompting i was marked for slaughter to be sacrificed to the sea powers beside the moaning waves to win them safe return but their intent i marked and ere they spilt the drops of wine and sprinkled hallowed meal upon mine head swiftly i fled and by the help of heaven i flung me down clasping the horse's feet and they sore loath perforce must leave me there dreading great zeus's daughter mighty souled in subtlety so he spake his soul untamed by pain for a brave man's part is to endure to the uttermost and of the trojans some believed him others for a wily knave held him of whose mind was laocoon wisely he spake a deadly fraud is this he said devised by the achaean chiefs yea and they had obeyed him and had scaped destruction but athena fiercely wroth with him the trojans and their city shook earth's deep foundations neath laocoon's feet straight terror fell on him and trembling bowed the knees of the presumptuous round his head horror of darkness poured a sharp pang thrilled his eyelids swam his eyes beneath his brows his eyeballs stabbed with bitter anguish throbbed even from the roots and rolled in frenzy of pain clear through his brain the bitter torment pierced even to the filmy inner veil thereof now bloodshot were his eyes now ghastly green anon with ruin they ran as pours a stream down from a rugged crag with falling snow made turbid as a man distraught he seemed all things he saw showed double 
and he groaned fearfully yet he ceased not to exhort the men of troy and recked not of his pain then did the goddess strike him utterly blind stared his fixed eyeballs white from pits of blood and all folk groaned for pity for their friend and dread of the prey giver lest he had sinned in folly against her and his mind was thus warped to destruction yea lest on themselves like judgment should be visited to avenge the outrage done to hapless Sinon's flesh whereby they hoped to wring the truth from him so led they him in friendly wise to troy pitying him at the last then gathered all and o'er that huge horse hastily cast a rope and made it fast above for under its feet smooth wooden rollers had apaeus laid that dragged by trojan hands it might glide into their fortress one and all they held with multitudinous tug and strain as when down to the sea young men sore laboring drag a ship hard crushed the stubborn rollers groan as sliding with weird shrieks the keel descends into the sea surge so that host with toil dragged up to their city their own doom a piteous work with great festoons of flowers they hung it and their own heads did they wreath while answering each other pealed the flutes grimly eno laughed seeing the end of that dire war hera rejoiced on high clad was athena when the trojans came unto their city break they down the walls their city's coronal that the horse of death might be led in troy's daughters greeted it with shouts of salutation marvelling all gaze at the mighty work where lurk their doom but still Laocoon ceased not to exhort his countrymen to burn the horse with fire. They would not hear, for dread of the god's wrath. But then a yet more hideous punishment Athena visited on his hapless sons. A cave there was beneath a rugged cliff exceeding high, unscalable, wherein dwelt fearful monsters of the deadly brood of Typhon in the rock clefts of the isle of Calydna, that looks Troyward from the sea. Thence stirred she up the strength of serpents twain, and summoned them to Troy. By her uproused, they shook the island as with an earthquake. Roared the sea, the waves disparted as they came. Onward they swept with fearful flicking tongues, shuddered the very monsters of the deep. Xanthus and Samoa's daughters moaned aloud the river nymphs. The Cyperian queen looked down in anguish from Olympus. Swiftly they came, whither the goddess sped them, with grim jaws wetting their deadly fangs. On his hapless sons sprang they. All Trojans panic-stricken fled, seeing those fearsome dragons in their town. No man, though ne'er so dauntless theretofore, tarried. Ghastly dread laid hold on all, shrinking in horror from the monsters. Screamed the women, Yea, the mother forgot her child, fear frenzied as she fled. All Troy became one shriek of fleers. The streets were choked with cowering fugitives. Alone was left Laocoon with his sons, for death's doom and the goddess chained their feet. Then, even as from destruction shrank the lads, those deadly fangs had seized and ravened up the twain, outstretching to their sightless sire agonized hands. No power to help had he. Trojans far off looked on from every side, weeping, all dazed, and, having fulfilled upon the Trojans' palace awful hest, those monsters vanished neath the earth, and still stands their memorial, where into the fane they entered of Apollo in Pergamus the hallowed. There before the sons of Troy gathered, and reared a cenotaph for those who miserably had perished. Over it their father from his blind eyes rained the tears. Over the empty tomb their mother shrieked, boding the while yet worse things, wailing o'er the ruin wrought by folly of her lord, treading the anger of the blessed ones. As when round her void nest in a break, in sorest anguish moans the nightingale, whose fledglings, ere they learned her plaintive song, a hideous serpent's fangs have done to death and left the mother anguish 
endless woe, and bootless crying round her desolate home. So groaned she for her children's wretched death, so moaned she o'er the void tomb, and her pangs were sharpened by her lord's plight, stricken blind. While she for children and for husband moaned, these slain, he of the sun's light portionless, the Trojans to the immortals sacrificed, pouring wine, their hearts beat high with hope to escape the weary stress of woeful war, albeit the victims burned not, and the flames died out, as though neath heavy hissing rain, and writhed the smoke rings, blood red, and the thighs quivering from crumbling altars fell to earth. Drink offerings turned to blood, God's statues wept, and the temple walls dripped gore. Along them rolled echoes of groaning out of depths unseen, and all the long walls shuddered. From the towers came quick sharp sounds like cries of men in pain and weirdly shrieking of themselves slid back the gate bolts screaming desolation wailed the birds of night above that god-built burg a mist palled every star and yet no cloud was in the flashing heavens by phoebus fain withered the bays that erst were lush and green wolves and foul-feeding jackals came and held within the gates I other signs untold appeared, portending woe to Dardanus' sons and Troy. Yet no fear touched the Trojans' hearts, who saw all through the town those portents dire. Fate crazed them all, that midst their reveling, slain by their foes, they might fill up their doom. One heart was steadfast, one soul clear-eyed, Cassandra. Never her words were unfulfilled, yet was their utter truth by fate's decree, ever as idle wind in the hearer's ears, that no bar to Troy's ruin might be set. She saw those evil portents all through Troy, conspiring to one end. Loud rang her cry, as roars a lioness that mid the brakes a hunter has stabbed or shot, whereat her heart maddens, and down the long hills rolls her roar, and her might waxes tenfold, so with heart aflame with prophecy came she forth her bower. Over her snowy shoulders tossed her hair, streaming far down, and wildly blazed her eyes. Her neck writhed, like a sapling in the wind shaken, as moaned and shrieked that noble maid. O oh, wretches! Into the land of darkness now we are passing, for round us full of fire and blood and dismal moan the city is. Everywhere portents of calamity God show. Destruction yawns before your feet. Fools, ye know not your doom. Still ye rejoice with one consent in madness, who to Troy have brought the Argive horse, where ruin lurks. Oh, ye believe me not, though ne'er so loud I cry. The Arrhenius and ruthless fates for Helen's spousals madly wroth through Troy dart on wild wings. And ye, ye are banqueting there in your last feast, on meats befelled with gore, when now your feet are on the paths of ghosts. Then cried a scoffing voice an ominous word. Why doth a raving tongue of evil speech, daughter of Priam, make thy lips to cry words empty as wind? No maiden modesty with purity fails thee. Thou art compassed round with ruinous madness, Therefore all men scorn thee, babbler. Hence thy evil boding speak to the Argives and thyself. For thee doth wait anguish and shame, yet bitterer than befell presumptuous Laocoon. Shame it were in folly to destroy the immortal's gift. So scoffed a Trojan. Others in like sort cried shame on her, and said she spake but lies, saying that ruin and fate's heavy stroke were hard at hand. They knew not their own doom, and mocked, and thrust her back from that huge horse, for fain was she to smite its beams apart, or burn with ravening fire. She snatched a brand of blazing pinewood from the hearth, and ran in fury. In the other hand she bare a two-edged halberd, and on that horse of doom she rushed. 
to cause the Trojans to behold with their own eyes the ambush hidden there. But straightway from her hands they plucked and flung afar the fire and steel, and careless turned to the feast, for darkened o'er them their last night. Within the horse the Argives joyed to hear the uproar of Troy's feasters, setting at naught Cassandra. But they marvelled that she knew so well the Achaeans' purpose and device. As mid the hills a furious pantheris, which from the steading hounds and shepherd-folk drive with fierce rush, with savage heart turns back even in departing, galled albeit by darts. So from the great horse fled she, anguish racked for Troy, for all the ruin she foreknew. End of chapter 12